please give him a big welcome. He goes by the name of Nikos Akuna. He's the chief visionary of Sysmic. All right. Thank you very much. Let's get the presentation up. Okay, I have the pleasure by day, my day job is being the chief visionary at Seismic where we explore how data could align creative media and data. But by night, I play the role of resident futurist so that I get to think about the future of humanity and its implications for all of us. I'm going to provide a framework through which you can understand how things are just happening faster and faster. It's based on accelerating change, and here are some of my insights, and I'll tie it all together. And first of all, thank God I'm the first one, because having to follow Moon and Simon is going to be a big challenge. So uh, here are some of my insights with symbiosis. Creativity has an algorithm. Adrian Bijan said that the designs in nature are not the result of chance. They rise naturally, spontaneously, because they enhance access to flow. These flow patterns exist in redwood trees, riverbeds, and lightning bolts with branches that reach out for the sun. These branches are patterns that utilize energy. They also provide oxygen that flows in the alveoli in our lungs. Energy and matter converge in time and space through neurons in our brains to enable us to sense, think, and act. If we're talking about AI, we are talking about the interaction between humans and machines, but there are these underlying patterns that take place between nature, between what's taking place in our brain, what's taking place in the alveoli in our lungs, these are called flow patterns, and Adrian Bijan had said it first. Adrian Bijan said that these intrinsic patterns exist in nature, and the premise of which is based on accelerating trends. But it's really easy to get confused today with all of the disruption that's taking place. We as marketers were dealing with so many different platforms at any given time, DMPs, DSPs. So I've aligned things on what I call the 3IE framework. It's the future of everything, so we could now start to categorize all of the, th the trends that are taking place. Interfaces, infrastructure, and information. This provides a recursive pattern through which our interfaces are getting better because of our technologies. Our technologies are getting better based on the infrastructure. We're talking cloud-based infrastructure, IoT. The internet is the best infrastructure of it all to now start to be able to make data more portable in real time. And obviously, AI sits at the intersection of all of this. Information is getting better because AI, what is AI doing? AI is helping us understand patterns that we don't know. It's helping us predict the future in that same way. But if we take a look at the exponential growth of computation taking place in real time, we are looking at something that's even far more monumental and compounding. How many of you guys have seen Ray Kurzweil's version of Moore's Law? Please raise your hand. Anybody here? One person, okay, the reason, two people. Okay, the reason why I wanna know this, I used to say that this was the most important graph in all of business and technology. I'm now of the opinion that this is the most important graph ever plotted, and here's why. What you're looking at here is a logarithmic scale. On the vertical axis, you're looking at price computation per constant dollar. How much computation can you get for a dollar? The, hor the horizontal axis is just time. But the dots on the graph there represent the best price performance computer of their day. This includes the mechanical device that took the census in 1890, the relay-based computer that cracked the Enigma code in World War II, the vacuum tube-based computer that predicted Eisenhower's win, and into the modern semiconductor era 
as we know it right now. So what Gordon Moore was saying in 1965, he eventually became the chairman of Intel, he was saying that as these chips get smaller and smaller, our capacity to compute has been compounding for as long as we've been able to measure it. That is why the supercomputers in your pockets are a million times more powerful, a thousand times cheaper, actually several hundred thousand times cheaper, and a hundred thousand times faster than the best communication device only the US president had just 30 years ago. And if you take the same monumental trend, now you can start to put this within a framework of all of the best technologies that are taking place over time. So I've plotted this through various trends, and this measures human-machine symbiosis, and I'll walk you through just some of the examples that I have. I've estimated this, and I don't even really like going through this example, but I was forced to make some prophecies. So I'll just do some estimations on some really interesting trends that are taking place, and based on where the, 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 the dot is, it's my level of certainty that these things are gonna happen and when they're gonna happen. So autonomous vehicles reaching 25% saturation by 2027 or so, one out of every four cars are gonna be completely autonomous. AI is going to pass the Turing test by 2027 or so, 2028. For those of you that don't know the Turing test, it's when you are interacting with a machine on the other end, and it's completely indistinguishable from a human or machine. You, you don't know whether or not you're talking to a machine or a human. That has deep implications for natural language processing, the chatbots that we're using right now, all of that good stuff. Really looking forward to this one. By 2030, and this is a bit aggressive, AR contact lenses, so augmented reality contact lenses that you're going to be able to, so if I'm interacting with you right now, the contact lenses that I'm wearing, it's gonna be like the Terminator point of view. I'll be able to distill what you're saying, I'll be able to look up your social media profile, you'll be able to speak to me in German, and I'll be able to understand you based on the AirPods that I'm wearing. Actually, the AirPods are gonna be deeper in my ears. And so we noticed that all of our devices, they, they were spiraled out of control before. We needed 100 different devices to accomplish all of the things that our iPhone can do right now. But now it's going to diverge back and we're going to be provided with more immersive types of experiences. So if we take a look at 2030, so past 2030, now we're looking at whole brain emulation. This is the ability for a computer to simulate everything that's going on inside the brain. This is talking about the specific neural configurations, synapses, dendrites, how the brain starts to formulate thoughts, how it formulates our experiences, our complete subjective experiences in real time. And that's just going to set off a domino effect for all of the preceding trends. 3D printing our organs. So imagine being able to, when you are in the ER and you need to do a very quick kidney transplant, you're going to be able to 3D print that singular organ and it's going to, your body's going to be able to accept it. Um, it's not going to reject that specific organ and that has deep implications for now we're looking at being true cyborg organisms. And past that, a neural link. So for those of you that have heard uh, Elon Musk talk about the neural link, being able to implant a chip inside your brain to augment your consciousness, to make you smarter. I actually think there's gonna be pretty stodgy iterations of this, but eventually the big vision is when you ingest a pill, you're gonna have nanobots at the intersection of genetics, robotics, nanotechnology. Again, chips getting smaller so that you'll be able to now detect propensity for disease, you'll be able to get smarter, you'll be able to increase your IQ threefold, fourfold, exponentially. Open source organic, <laughs> organic orchestration. So that's a long term for saying that we'll be able to, with new types of interfaces, be able to write genome sequences the way that Shakespeare and Schauser wrote verse. So being able to write our way into a new hairstyle, a new hair color, people will be able to have gills if they want to swim underwater for an hour at a time. That's getting really weird, right? So now we're going from science fiction to science fact. Cryonics are gonna go mainstream, meaning that you'll be able to uh, be in a self-induced coma. If you have a terminal illness, you'll be able to go in a coma and wake up 50 years from now. And then that's you know past 2050, now we're getting into 
consciousness emulated by AI. So AI will help us understand our own conscious experience and toward immortality. So you have companies like California Life Extension Company, Craig Venter, Peter Diamandis, who's working on this problem that we call death. So being able to extend our human lifespan, but also now being able to create and understand how we can extend our lives in that same way. So with that, cognition is going to be uploaded into the matrix. We'll be able to self-replicate, and then quite literally, our subjective experience will be able to replicate, and we'll be able to be connected with absolutely everyone. I'm going to leave you guys with this vision. This is my friend, Su Gwen Chung. She is an augmented intelligence artist. And what she does is she uses mimicry to actually mimic patterns with a robot that she coded herself called Doug, a drawing operations unit. And I'm gonna leave you with the last thought that we don't all have to be superhuman just yet. These have very incremental steps toward getting to this type of vision, but people are doing it right now. You, with the mobile phones in your pockets, with the platforms that you're utilizing today to derive insights, to understand your customers, to find the connections between brands and audiences more meaningfully, you're doing this right now and you are on your way to becoming augmented. We are already augmenting our cognition into our mobile phones. And with these types of technologies, I believe that we are going to surpass, we are going to transcend our limitations, all of our limitations. But we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to make humanity thrive. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Nikos, thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, that was the first of our three profits, but there are some more to come. So, yeah, take all the pictures, that's cool. Right, taking notes is very old school, taking pictures much better. But ladies and gentlemen, are you ready for more? We have a rock star coming on stage, so are you ready for more? Alright, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Moon Reba. She's a Mangana, the founder of Sound of Cyborg Foundation. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Wow, what an entrance. Thank you. Uh, so I want to start saying that I actually identify myself as a, as a cyborg because I, because I have implants in my body that allow me to extend my senses through the, our natural senses. So through the senses we perceive the outside world, but if there are many things that happen that we cannot perceive uh, because our senses can be l very limited. And I tell you, everything has started because I actually I'm a dancer and a choreographer, and when I was studying choreography and movement research, I realized there's many movement that happens around us that we cannot perceive. So my aim uh, suddenly got that I wanted to perceive this imperceptible movement, like to get uh, uh, to perceive movement in the deepest way I could. And I did some different experiments about the speed of the people walking in front of me, or maybe the presence I have behind my body. But then, after, after experiencing all these movements that I had around, I wanted to perceive a movement that was more universal, that, that my perception of movement didn't depend on people or objects. And then I realized that actually the Earth constantly moves, no, not only rotates about itself and around the sun, but constantly shakes through earthquakes. And I thought it would be amazing to be united to this natural and huge movement because it's, it's a huge movement, but most of the time imperceptible. So in order to do that, what I did is that I have now some implants on the top of my feet that are connected to online seismographs. And whenever there's an earthquake anywhere in the planet, I feel a vibration inside my body. So now I'm here in Cologne, in Colonia, Cologne, Cologne, I don't know how, in, in Spanish it would be Colonia. And, uh, but if there's an earthquake in California or in Japan or in Greece, I would feel a vibration inside the body. And depending on the intensity of these vibrations, of, of the earthquake, the vibration I feel is stronger or less strong. And I call this the seismic sense, the sense of being connected to the natural movement of the Earth. 
in the beginning, I had to get used to feeling all these vibrations. Uh, and of course, like for example, in the middle of the, of the night, if there was a big one, then I would wake up. Now I just, I just wake up when there's a big one before. It was very, very often because the brain has to get used to this new input. And maybe when I was talking and I could feel, and I would feel the vibrations, I would like stop talking because I was interrupted. So Earth kept interrupting my daily life. But now it's part of me. It's part of my identity. And now a, a way that I have to describe it is like I have two beats, like I have the heartbeat and the earth beat having its own rhythm inside my body. And I see this as cyborg art. I feel like now artists no longer need to use technology as a tool. We can use technology as part of ourselves and change our perception of reality. So I feel like maybe the, the artwork of a cyborg artist would be the creation of a new sense. So I see the seismic sense of my, it's like my artwork, but it's an artwork that happens inside the artist. So I'm the audience of my own art. So in cyborg art, the art is the space where it happens and the artwork, it's, this, it's in the same place. So that's a bit of a problem because I can I have difficulty to share what I feel because it's my own experience. But in order to share uh, these seismic uh, feelings, I create external artwork. And one of the pieces that I have it's called Waiting for Earthquakes. And Waiting for Earthquakes is like a waiting room where the audience and I just wait for a yeah, the volume can be can be lower. Um, where the audience and I just wait for an earthquake to take place, and whenever this happens, I move according to the intensity of the earthquake. So if there are no earthquakes during the performance, there will be no dance. Some festivals are very worried about this. Like, what if there are no earthquakes? Like, it's not my fault, because uh, in this piece, like, Earth is the choreographer of the piece, and I'm just interpreting the, the data that happens. Another way that I have to share what I feel is through percussion, what I call seismic percussion, where actually the rhythm of the piece is based on the rhythm of the tectonic plates. And I have two ways of doing this. One is also based on real time. So whenever there's, there's an earthquake, the, the rhythm of the piece changes. Or I also create what I, a scores, uh, a scores based on the seismic activity that happened in a specific place. For example, the first one I did was in Mexico, and I researched all the earthquakes that, that happened in, the, in, early, in Mexico in the last 50 years, and I put them all together in a score of 10-minute piece, and then I played, the, I played this score so the people from Mexico could hear uh, how their country had been moving. So in this case, Earth is the composer of the piece, and I'm just interpreting uh, the data. In 2010, with my childhood friend Neil Harbison and I, founded the Cyborg Foundation, basically with three aims. One is to help humans to become cyborgs, the other one is to promote cyborg art, and the other one is to, to defend the cyborg rights, the right of being able to design yourself. Um, the word cyborg actually was... Um, was going to describe people that have to change the, themselves in order to survive in other environments. They thought if we have to survive in a space, rather than create spaceships and going there, we should uh, change ourselves, design ourselves in order to survive in a space. So I think that maybe we should design ourselves in order to understand and survive on Earth. But since it was going, it has been used in, in many different ways. And in the Cyber Foundation, we thought that maybe one could be three, three different ways of being a cyborg. So we thought that one could be psychological cyborg, which is the, the feeling of becoming a cyborg. Maybe most of you are already psychological cyborgs. When you your mobile phone is running out, out of battery, saying, I'm running out of battery, instead of saying, my mobile phone is running out of battery. So you, you treat your phone as if it was part of you. One could be a biological cyborg, which is the physical union between cybernetics and organism. One could be a neurological cyborg, cyber, which is the modification of the mind because of this union between technology and, and yourself. One of the projects uh, that we did in the in the Science Foundation is actually we were in Brazil for for a week, and we and actually Neil and I we have bad teeth and we had a, a missing tooth. Actually, Neil had two had one. So we proposed to the team that to create another type of tooth. So we create a prototype when one uh, was implanted in Neil's mouth and I was implanted in, in my mouth. So whenever he clicked, I would feel a vibration. Whenever I click he would feel a vibration. And we both know the Morse code, so we were actually being able to send each other words by clicking our mouth. We call this a transcendental communication system because it's a communication system that goes from tooth to tooth. And actually, it, it works through Bluetooth, so it was a Bluetooth tooth. 
This was a performance about it. And actually, I also want to say that actually now that I feel a cyborg, I don't feel closer to robots or to machines. I feel closer to, to Earth and to nature because I can feel the planet is moving constantly. I think it's very different to know that the Earth is moving than actually to feel that the Earth Earth is moving. Also feel closer to other species because like, maybe I can relate more how they perceive reality. Sometimes we don't need to think very a lot of science fiction. Just taking a look at nature, we can, we can get very inspired. Like some animals can uh, fly, can perceive in, infrared, ultraviolet, and immortality that exists in nature because there's a jellyfish that never dies and keeps regenerating. We feel that with these new senses, we don't do uh, virtual reality, augmented reality. We feel that we reveal reality or real reality because with these new senses we, we have a deeper experience of the reality around us. I also feel transpicious because I feel like I have a new sense and a new body part that is no longer defined as a human sense. And we actually, last year we founded the Transpicia Society and we have a, a studio in Barcelona and a lab where we create new senses and, and defend the people that don't define themselves as 100% human. Also, I want to say that for hundreds and hundreds of years, humans have been changing the environment in order to live more comfortable. And maybe we have arrived on a time that maybe we should change ourselves in order to adapt better to the planet we live in. For example, night vision exists in nature, but maybe we invented the, the artificial light instead of the night vision. And actually, it's late, daylight outside, but we're using all this light because we are unable to see each other without, without, without this artificial light. So maybe instead of modifying the planet and creating, creating all this unnecessary energy, maybe we could modify the, uh, ourselves and then leave the half of the planet dark when it should be dark and not light it up and wasting so much energy. Also, well, uh, no, my because I have very few seconds. It makes me nervous. Okay. Also, my current my current project is actually to feel the seismic activity of the moon. So this will actually allow me to be physically on Earth and having my feet on the moon. Uh, the moon also shakes with moonquakes, and we call this actually to be a sense astronaut. We no longer need to be physically on on a space and have an and be an astronaut. We can remain on Earth and have new sensors to explore space, and we call this becoming a sense astronaut. And just uh, to finish, we I just want to suggest you that actually. The, we are the ones who decide how the union between humans and technology has to be. It doesn't have to be a distance from nature. We, uh, actually, we can decide that the union between humans and technology makes us closer to nature, to other species, and also to, to space. Thank you. Moon rivers, ladies and gentlemen. But there is more to come, ladies and gentlemen. We have three profits, and now the next one is coming. Please welcome Simon Haladin, founder and... Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> there we are, all the time, the time frame. All right. Have fun. All right, I'm going to stand a little bit more on this side because there's a surprise. Uh, you know, maybe somebody figured it out already. So thank you very much for having me here. It's really, really uh, having a good time here. I hope everybody here is having a good time. So is everybody having a good time or are you just, uh, yeah. All right, so bear with me. We're gonna have some fun for the next couple of minutes. Uh, so my name is Simon Haddadin. I'm the CEO and co-founder of Franka Emika and we are a robotics company from Munich. So we develop robots, we produce robots, we develop the entire software framework. So everything that is from the end to end, everything you need to get a robot. And um, why is a robotics guy at DMX Co? Well, under the tagline of profits, it's a big word, so I wouldn't say that to myself. But we're all dreaming about connecting the digital world with the physical world. And that is what robots do, the cyber-physical systems. So we're entering right now, um, most of the things end somehow at the screen. And we want to enter into the next step, and that is the physical world. And that is what we need robots for. But what is robotics today? Robotics today, what you know is something that only very, very few people can actually afford. It's a luxurious good. We have very, very few numbers of robots outside in the world. They're humongously expensive. Very few people can actually only program them. Um, they're dangerous pre-programmed positioning machines. We put them in safety cages, actually not to protect the robot, but to protect us, because if you're going to enter that space, the robot will not know that you're there. And the fourth point, which is always highly critical, what can these machines do, actually? As they are pre-programmed positioning machines, 
Well, they move from A to B, and they do that for five years or 10 years or even longer. But everything that requires contact, so interaction with the real world, they just cannot do. And this is where we come into place. We at Franca Emica, where is this one? We at Franca Emica, we believe that robotics should be accessible to everyone. And what does that mean? It means it should be affordable, so not four, five, six hundred thousand euros for a standard application, but 10% of that, 5% of that. It should be usable for everyone here in the audience. It should be highly functional, so easy to use, but also super, super performant. And that's what I'm going to show you in the next couple of minutes, and I hope, because this is going to be live, no fake. That's what we're famous for, I, I heard. Um, that's just a tablet, don't worry, there's not much happening here. Um, <laughs> just give me a sec. I have to unlock the screen. I hope I didn't forget the password. All right. So oh, hold on a second. This is <laughs> not to be shown yet. All right. Just give me a sec. All right. So welcome my co-host, my good friend that I brought all the way from Munich, Panda. So Panda is a new generation of soft robotics, or so soft robots, so a robot that is actually capable of interacting with the real world. And all this topic, everything together, we call human-centered robotics. So let's start with a human feature that is saying hello to everybody, all the way in the back, all the way in the front. But waving around with robots, you've seen that many, many times. But what we are doing is the next generation, and that is physical interaction. So shaking the hand actually of a robot, and he can shake my hand and I can shake his hand. And this is where the world is going. And I'm going to show you now some live programming, but I would like to, can some people raise their hands who want to come with me on stage? But we're not faking this, so I don't know who you are, and I'm going to look in this direction and I'm just going to, all right. It's a photographer. <laughs> so he has a job, okay, so you're more or less in the same direction, so come over here, give it a, give it a hand. Just come up. So we're going to take the tablet now over here. So just uh, stand right. Come here. Don't. Okay. You, sh you should be more afraid of me than him. Okay. So. All right. So first of all, what is your name? Annie. Oh, what? Annie. Annie. Uh, Annie. Yes. Annie. All right. Annie. Have you ever programmed a robot? I have not. Okay. Then let's see. So first of all, please come here and shake his hand. You basically just take him by the hand like you do with everybody. Okay. And you will feel yeah. that it's super smooth, right? And why is this happening? Just hold on. Um, I'm going to show you some cool stuff now. And you're going to live program, so I'm going to move him to the side. But <laughs> it's way too far, so maybe, maybe come up a bit closer now again. Now you have to stand here a little bit with me. And I'm going to show you a behavior we introduce into robots. That is muscular behavior. So what humans can do, we can contract our muscles or we can relax our muscles. And now if you try to pull this, you will see it's super stiff. It's really hard. Yeah. And you're soon going to break it, I'm sure. Oh, yo, yo. <laughs> okay, and then now we do it a little bit more compliant. So that means, and now try it again. Wait. I think you broke it already, but. And now you'll see the difference, just with one click. Yeah. Right, ah, and we can, can we transfer? Uh, because I have the HDMI, can I? Ah, it's on this side? Okay, thank you. So, and we can even do this to a next step. And the next step is that we have an almost 20 kilo robot here. Well, actually, it's 17.8 kilos. And we can overcompensate and give him a gravity like on the moon. So you can actually move around the 20 kilo robot with your little pinky finger. Just and lift him up like this. Don't be afraid. It's nothing going to happen. I want to break it again. Nah, like this. <laughs> <laughs> so there's... Wait, yeah, now you broke it again. <laughs> no, no, it's, don't worry about it. So, all right, so now I showed you one feature. Now I'm just going to take him down a little bit. And uh, this is some behavioral feature. And now the next feature I want to show you is a safety feature. So we don't want put robots. Obviously, we don't have safety cages here, and you did not sign any form that this is, might be dangerous or not. But just come here now. Don't be so afraid, you know, there's nothing going to happen. <laughs> and you can just touch the robot and he will immediately understand that somebody's interacting with him. So just like that. And anywhere on the body, I just have to restart him in this direction. Mm -hmm. And now just go ahead. Yeah, he already felt it. And even 
We can go so far that we can use a balloon. And even the balloon, the robot can feel that there's a balloon. So he's going to stop and never, ever, 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 and ever, ever <laughs> going to hurt you. And even in here. So the, the sense of touch in this robot is not only somewhere hidden in the front, it's all over the body. And that is why we can do super cool things with it. Because obviously we did not, did not develop a robot to do party tricks with balloons and, and not to hurt humans. But we can take selfies. And uh, yeah, <laughs> that's why you are here now. <laughs> So basically, just come here. We are, we are on the screen, right? Somewhere. So what you see here is on the screen is the programming environment. So you don't write any codes anymore, uh, anything like that. You're just using, just like on your smartphone. OK, now I'm opening the user menu. That's the wrong one. You're just using, like on your smartphone, apps, right? And we're going to show the robot now how to take a selfie with a with an iPhone or smartphone, I'm probably not allowed to say the name. So all you have to do now is basically show the robot, because he doesn't know where the home button is. That's all you need to tell him. So you take him by the hand, like a little child. You push these two buttons, not too strong, because then he's going to stop, just like that. And then you can move him around. And you push the button with the a bit straight, you know. <laughs> yeah, just take it. Just hold it like this. And then you just wait. And then you just push this button. With these two as well? This button. Just that one. Only this one. And then you'd push him again here. Okay. And lift up a little bit, and that's it. Not so high. Like this. And then we're done. And then, let's see if it actually works. Because that would be really embarrassing now on stage <laughs> if it doesn't work. And we're going to, oh, no, not shut down. I'm sorry. Just need to take the full screen out. All right. So I'm going to play this now. And just in case nobody sees it, I'm letting it run this camera now. So everybody can hopefully see the... Can you see the film over there? So what you see now, she just showed him how where's the home button, and the robot is pushing the home button once and maybe twice. <laughs> All right. And then he's going to opening the camera, change to selfie camera, obviously, change to the timer, Give him 10 seconds, and basically that's it. And then he's going to move into position, and you come with okay. me. And you're going to get this per mail or WhatsApp or whatever you want. So it's a really long time. Yeah, the timer is a bit long. All right, I think that's it. And let's see if the last one also works. So. A great photo. Can you see it? Yeah. Yeah. All right, so I think I have no idea how much time I have left, so I guess I'm uh, about to run out of time. So uh, all I want to show in the last couple of seconds is uh, saying goodbye to everybody at Mexico. We really had a great time here. And we actually wanted to do a live stream onto a booth uh, at Hall 9. Unfortunately, Wi-Fi at Messe, everybody knows how the problem, but so hello from everybody. I hope you can see it on that screen. So this is where we think the future in robotics is going. Just like everybody has supercomputers in their pockets now, is that in 10 or 15 years, everybody will have robots at home uh, helping us, or helping especially those people that cannot help themselves anymore, like those two guys, you know, that are <laughs> waving like. And uh, then I thank you very much, and I hope you all enjoy the rest of New Mexico. And thank you very much, and take care. Bye-bye. Wait, 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 wait. Thank you very much. Thank you.